afternoon, everybody. Um, hope everyone can uh, can hear me. If you can't, uh, unmute yourself and sh give a shout out, please. Okay, hearing none, we'll assume everybody can hear me. Um, as you can see from the screen, um, and some of you may be familiar with this document or, or the information that we're going to go over already, um, but basically, uh, again, we're going to talk about attaching res or deck ledgers to uh, floor assemblies that uh, are constructed with metal plate connected wood trusses, as it uh, sometimes can be a little bit more complicated than if you're uh, framing with uh, dimension lumber or using engineered wood eye joists. As Trish indicated, if um, you want to go ahead and uh, as we're going through the presentation, if you have any questions, just unmute yourself and speak out. We'll try to address the, the you know questions in real time as as opposed to waiting till the end. I think we're going to have pl uh, plenty of time today in the next hour to get through the presentation. So, again, shout out if you have any questions. Uh, just this side kind of slide giving a little bit of a background about SBCA. Some of you. Um, we've been around long enough, I'll probably recognize uh, the fact that uh, prior till about, uh, I want to say maybe eight years ago now, se uh, seven years ago, uh, SBCA was known as the Wood Trust Council of America, but uh, because of uh, manufacturers and the uh, membership and all the different uh, building components that they're involved with, the, uh, the name was changed. The uh, presentation this afternoon obviously will be to go through uh, some construction details for residential deck ledger attachment to floor assemblies that are constructed with metal plate connected with trusses. Um, we're also going to review some installation instructions and uh, just know that uh, the uh, information we're going to be covering this afternoon should be in conformance with the uh, both the IBC and the IRC. Uh, and uh, any state uh, specific requirements as well. Obviously, uh, proper attachment of the deck, residential or a deck, to the structure is very important. Um, there's different ways it can be done. Um, safety, obviously, is uh, paramount. Um, many times, deck collapses or problems that occur with decks uh, typically occur with this attachment if it's a if, if the deck is attached to the uh, existing structure through the ledger that's a critical connection many failures and, and problems can occur at this location um, you also have problems associated with uh, improper flashing or detailing so that you end up with moisture intrusion and ultimately end up with decay that can be another problem um, so again, very critical. And so what we're going to be talking about today would be details that provide for attaching a two-inch nominal lumber ledger deck, or excuse me, deck ledger, to residential floor assemblies um, for, with, with trusses. Obviously, what we're trying to do is avoid uh, what's occurring in both of these uh, pictures, um, and especially what has occurred on the, uh, the photograph on the right-hand side. Now, uh, in early July of this year, um, NBC News did a story um, on residential decks and some of the concerns uh, that we'll be going over today. And I believe at the time of that uh, news story, uh, they, I believe the reporter indicated that there were something on the order of 52 or 54 uh, deck collapses that had occurred uh, from the beginning of the year through early part of July. And um, so again, this is a, a very real uh, problem and, and real issue. A little bit of background before we get into the more specific uh, discussion with, with trusses. Um, but the 2009, 2012, 2015 International Residential Code includes prescriptive provisions for attaching two-inch nominal lumber deck ledgers to two-inch nominal lumber band joists bearing directly on the sill plate or a wall plate using one half inch diameter bolts or lag screws. And uh, what we're showing here would be table R507.2, 
which shows what the maximum spacing between the connection of the ledger to the band beam. Uh, you're allowed for the different type of fasteners and then different joist bands. And this is for deck live load of 40 pounds per square foot, uh, 10 pounds per square foot dead load, and then uh, snow loads of less than or equal to 40 pounds per square foot. And so basically what we're looking at in this case is uh, dimension lumber being used uh, in the floor uh, with a uh, band joist that uh, is, or, or rim joist that basically encapsulates the uh, floor joists and then the deck ledger is either bolted or lagged uh, to that uh, band joist or rim joist. The uh, background, um, and I, Buddy, I know you're on this call, um, so hopefully I'm not going to misspeak too much, um, but the uh, American Wood Council, I guess we need to correct this slide, don't we? American Wood Council, or AF&PA is American Wood Council, has developed a, a design for code acceptance document um, that provides prescriptive residential wood deck construction uh, guidelines. Um, very good document. Um, it gets into a lot of uh, information uh, in terms of what the minimum requirements and limitations would be for the decking materials to be used, um, joist size, uh, the beam size, joist to beam connection, column requirements, rim joist requirements, footings, ledger attachments, you name it. Um, the first time I, I, I saw this document, and this is going back now probably about 10 years ago, um, I believe the initial document uh, was produced by uh, Fairfax County, Virginia, uh, and perhaps working in conjunction with uh, the AWC. And the current version, I believe, is a con uh, it's uh, Fairfax County, uh, the American Wood Council, and then also the uh, the ICC uh, International Code Council has also um, has been involved in the development of this document. Now, in this particular document, like I said, it's primarily geared towards uh, conventional construction using uh, dimension lumber. Um, and basically, the provisions, much of it are, have to do with, um, and that are included in the IRC, um, really go back to some testing that was done at Virginia Tech and Washington State University. Um, and the whole reason for doing this testing and, and, and what the testing basically uh, that, that was done uh, in developing the connection requirements, um, they basically looked at two-inch nominal pressure preservative treated hem fir and southern pine ledgers. Uh, they felt that uh, the reason they chose those two species of uh, ledger material was that, that they were by far and away the most common of treated ledger uh, material dimension lumber that's out there um, throughout the United States. Uh, they also took a look at attaching a two inch nominal to or attaching the ledger to two inch nominal spruce pine fir or one inch net Douglas fir laminated veneer lumber band joists um, through 15 30 second inch thick OSB sheathing and then they attached with half inch diameter uh, bolts and leg screws, hot tip galvanized. Um, now you might say, why would they have to do testing? Why couldn't they just go to uh, look at the uh, wood const uh, look at the uh, national design specification for wood construction? Well, the primary reason would actually be the second uh, sub bullet point that we show on this slide, and that is that the minimum requirements um, for penetration of the fasteners that are provided or re in, in the uh, NDS would be four diameters. So if you're using a, a half inch diameter screw, four times a half inch is two inch and you're trying to connect to an inch and a half inch thick uh, band joist. So either uh, for deck attachment you're going to have to go with a thicker band joist, uh, which is not typically done, or in this case they, based, uh, they did some testing to, to verify and to come up with what the connection requirements can be. Again, for attaching uh, two-inch nominal treated deck ledger to a two-inch nominal uh, band joist. 
Um, they also pointed out that in this uh, the Virginia Tech and WSU studies that uh, many times the ledger is not in direct contact with the band joist. Uh, obviously, you've got your wood structural sheathing or whatever coming, you know, uh, that's on, on the outside of the wall, and usually the ledger is attached over the top of that. So anyway, the testing was done, and um, ultimately the um, spacing tables that are in the building code now, the IRC, is really based on that testing. Now, the DCA-6 um, also includes some, some basic information regarding uh, if you're using, if your floor system or floor assembly is, is uh, constructed with wood eye joists um, and also manufactured wood trusses. Um, the, if you're using eye joists, typically the eye joist manufacturers, the different depths of the eye joists are, don't quite match the same depth of, say, dimension lumber that could be used for a, a joist uh, in a floor, floor application. Um, there's a, typically a reason for this. Um, I know from my trust joist days, um, you know, the engineered wood eye joists are uh, usually well, they're manufactured dry, uh, and they're typically installed dry, and so they're not going to shrink and 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 um, as moisture con as the moisture content changes, at least not as as much as if um, one is using uh, dimension lumber as as a floor joist. And uh, I know Sherm Nelson and the group at Trust Joist were pretty adamant about not trying to use a two by ten rim <coughs> with, say, a, a uh, an eye joist. Uh, because of how you could end up having, first of all, the, the, the depth is not going to be the same. Um, and also they didn't want the rim, in this case, uh, shrinking away and, and basically requiring then the end of the eye joist to carry the full load, not only from the floor, but say from the wall or you know, floors and, and roof above. Um, so typically when you're using eye joists, uh, the band board or rim board is going to be some type of structural composite lumber. And uh, it, depending upon who the manufacturer is and, and what's being used, uh, thicknesses can vary. Uh, but the minimum uh, thickness of material that's out there now is about one inch thick. So um, this DC, uh, DCA6 points out that that's typically the minimum thickness of um, rim board that you're going to use if you're using eye joists and for attaching the ledger to. Um, with manufactured uh, wood trusses or metal plate connected wood trusses, um, it's a little bit different game here, and we'll talk about that here shortly, but uh, requires basically a detail if you're going to use, um, attach a, a ledger or a deck to a floor assembly that is framed with metal plate connected wood floor trusses. Um, that's going to require some type of a detail provided by either truss designer or registered design professional, um, industry standard details. Uh, you can also design the deck so that you don't need a ledger. So basically a self-supporting deck um, would be another option. And okay, so with, uh, with metal plate connected wood trusses, uh, back in about, uh, I want to say 2007, 2008, um, at that time the Wood Trust Council of America, we came up with a tech note. And for those of you that have a copy of the, um, the current edition, of the um, DCA-6 document from AWC um, on page 13 of that document for metal plate connected or for manufactured wood trusses. Um, the last sentence says, refer to tech note attachment of residential deck ledger to metal plate connected wood truss floor system for special blocking details and attachment requirements. And then they list our, uh, provide the website the current website address. Um, buddy, if you don't mind making a note, I'm going to make a note. We need to basically, next time this document, your DCA is, is updated, we'll have to update that reference. Because what you're looking at on the screen here is the, the current version or uh, upgrade of that uh, tech note, and that is this SBC Association Research Report. Okay, so as an overview, the um, SRR, the research report, uh, for this ledger attachment to uh, metal plate connected uh, floor assemblies, um, 
The reference number is 1408-01, and at the end of the presentation, I'll show you how you can get a copy by going to the website. Um, what this document, again, includes recommendations and details for the attachment of residential deck ledgers to either the end of the metal plate connected wood floor trusses. So in other words, the deck ledger is attached uh, perpendicular to the span of the trusses at the end of the truss. Um, or to the side of the metal plate connected wood ladder frames. Um, and we'll talk about what that is for those of you that are not familiar with that term. Um, what the current version of this document does not include, however, does not provide any information uh, regarding the attachment of the deck ledgers to the end of cantilevered floor trusses, nor does it include any information on attaching the deck ledgers with proprietary high strength screws such as uh, Simpson I know makes several different types uh, so does Fasten Master, USP, um, other, certainly others that are out there. So right now this document basically is, we've tried to keep it as generic as possible so the connections that are specified or called out are either using a half inch diameter uh, through bolt or uh, lag screws. Okay, cantilevered floor examples. Um, obviously the photo on the left is not a truss, that's an eye joist. Some of the problems that you run into with uh, trying to attach a residential deck or decks to the end of a cantilevered uh, floor system and these would be, these problems would be the same whether it's a truss, uh, dimension lumber, or uh, in this case, as that figure shows, an eye joist. Um, one of the problems, first of all, is has that eye joist been, or has that uh, cantilevered member been designed to support the additional load that the deck now is going to uh, add to its end? Um, you know, obviously, one of the big problems, if you will, with uh, with decks is they're not always constructed at the time that the uh, house is is built. And so the question becomes, well, how big of a deck are they going to end up putting on, on, the, uh, on the back of the house or off the side of the house or whatever? And when are they going to do it? Um, there's also some major problems um, with the way this particular ledger attachment in this figure is detailed um, because, you know, you've got the leg screws attaching the deck ledger through the sheathing and through the rim that is nailed to the end of the eye joist in this case um, and that connection is not very good uh, between the the rim board and um, just the nails going into the end grain of the eye joist flanges. Um, There's certainly ways that, uh, that you can detail a, a, a good connection uh, using an inverted hanger or something like that um, would be one method. Again, there are different ways of doing it but so typically um, you know, you get into a cantilevered floor example, our SRR 1408-01 does not uh, address this type of application um, and further uh, study and analysis needs to take place. Um, the other thing I want to point out, and I apologize for the lousy uh, quality, but the picture at the right, basically what we're trying to show there is we currently really don't have any information in this SRR 1408 of uh, where you've got in, in, in some of the northern climates like Wisconsin and Minnesota, it's not uncommon to have um, up to two inches of uh, foam insulation on the outside of the foundation wall. So what they'll typically do is, is they'll extend the top plate of the wall out over the foam and as a result the floor truss uh, in this case the end or the ladder uh, in, the, in the figure on the far right um, gets extended out over that foam. Uh, now maybe with the ladder situation it's really not, you know, you still have the majority of that uh, member over the structural uh, foundation wall. Um, but, you know, for those of you that uh, where a, this detail is pretty common in terms of the foam sheathing um, on the outside of the foundation wall, um, the SRR that we're going to be going over today really doesn't cover this application. We are working on some details, so if you can bear with us, hopefully uh, within the next uh, month or two, we should, you know, we'll be expanding um, 
the scope of, of the SRR to include some, some details and recommendations for these two figures that are on the, uh, the, uh, the sketches on the right side of this, this uh, slide. Um, the other thing, obviously, that uh, the SRR does not cover is, you know, we're, we're basically looking at uh, 40 pounds per square foot live load or 60 pounds per square foot live load on the deck, uniformly distributed. We're not uh, taking into account uh, the additional weight, say, from a hot tub, um, and we certainly are not looking at attaching the deck ledger through uh, stone or, mace or uh, masonry veneer. Um, into the end of the member. And that same holds true with the DCA6 document as well. Okay, so with trusses, um, again, a little bit different animal. And what makes it more complicated is, um, you know, that the trusses are, are, are is a designed product. It's designed for the app specific application that it's being installed in or used for. Um, and when you get to installing the floor trusses, uh, they, there are several different ways that they can encapsulate the end. Um, in certain applications, manufacturers, uh, you know, their, their customer may prefer that they use uh, blocking panels, which is basically, think of that as a, a very small and short uh, metal plate connected wood truss that's basically manufactured, manufactured to the same height as the floor trusses and it is manufactured to fit in between the floor trusses. Um, doesn't happen very often, but it certainly can happen, okay? Um, if the floor truss height it happens to match that of, say, a, a, a common height of a, a wood eye joist, then you could theoretically or, or technically use a rim board, structural composite rim board of the same height and, and use that. Um, again, could be done. It's not typically done. Um, you know, if, if you're using the detail on the far right with a rim board, uh, well then, obviously, now you can start attaching the deck ledger. If you've got that and you have to attach a deck ledger to that, um, then you can basically use the prescriptive requirements uh, that are in the building code. Um, What's typically done with metal plate connected wood trusses is what the figure in the, the enlarged figure in the middle, and that is basically where you've got the floor trusses that come on over or they, they bear on the outside wall, the foundation wall, and then there's a little step that's basically uh, included in the ends of the truss up near the top where it, it's meant that they install a two by four ribbon board, and that ribbon board is not intended to uh, for someone to attach a deck ledger, okay? That ribbon board, the primary uh, use and, and um, what that ribbon board is intended for, primary intention, is basically to help stabilize the floor trusses as they are being installed in the assembly until the floor sheathing and the uh, wall sheathing uh, gets installed uh, at the ends of the truss and the floor sheathing on top. So again, the ribbon board is not, um, intended as a structural member for attaching a deck ledger. Apologize for the poor quality of, of this uh, slide, but basically this is showing again an assembly of floor trusses. The pink that are basically included on the outside uh, ends of the trusses, that's the ribbon board. Um, and again, I had mentioned a ladder frame. If you look at the, um, the very left end where uh, we've got a, looks like a trust member that's sitting on an outside wall or uh, the, the right end of this document, right front, uh, just under or just above where it says strong back. Um, that's what we're, the industry typically refers to as a ladder frame. Uh, what it basically is, it's a short wall or a very, uh, yeah, short wall basically that uh, is, it, but instead of attaching the uh, plate material with nails, um, uh, metal plate connected or metal connector plates, excuse me, are used to attach the vertical web members or studs to the uh, top and bottom cord of the truss. This is what the industry typically would refer to as a non-structural truss. What we mean by that is you don't see any triangles, you don't see any diagonal webs in that member. Now that is a, like I said, a very short wall um, and 
so it certainly is capable of transferring gravity loads from the structure above to the support below, but it needs to be supported along its entire length. So uh, that's what, again, industry refers to as a non-structural uh, truss. And in this case, also for floors, the ladder frame is, is one of the common terms used. Um, the information that's provided in SRR 1408-01 uh, um, includes or is based on the design values that were developed from the Virginia Tech and, and Washington State University testing. Um, and it also assumes that the fasteners are installed in accordance with the, uh, with NDS for in terms of using the proper clearance holes, uh, lead holes, edge distance, and end distance. Um, and that's really where the devil is in this case because of you've got different parts and uh, making sure that you're meeting the requirements of uh, NDS and the building code in terms of your fastener spacing and location. We'll get into that in a little bit. Basically, um, Obviously, um, it's not a good idea to try to nail a deck ledger to a rim board or to metal plate the end of or side of metal plate connected wood trusses. Um, the deck ledger must be attached to the truss and verticals of the truss or to the um, vertical webs, studs in a uh, ladder frame. Or if, depending upon the size of the deck, uh, you may have to also install key blocking um, in addition to the, the truss members in order to get enough fasteners. Um, but basically, if the options or what we're going to be going over um, should, again, meet the requirements of the uh, deemed in compliance with the, uh, with the building code. So in terms of... Uh, minimum deck ledger requirements now that we spell out in SRR 1408. Um, minimum 2 by 10 or 2 by 12 lumber, specific gravity greater than or equal to 0 0.43, okay? Um, and then identified by the grade mark of, uh, uh, or certificate of an inspection issued by an approved lumber grading or inspection bureau, okay? In other words, it's got to be grade um, stressed lumber that's used. Um, and those of you that are uh, registered design professionals or familiar with, with, with wood, um, the specific gravity of 0.43, again, uh, probably one of the most common species or species groups that uh, uh, have a 0.43 specific gravity would be hem fir. Um, spruce pine fir is 0.42. And now again, we're talking about the ledger, okay? So this is going to be a uh, pressure, preservative pressure treated piece of, of wood. Um, and there are only s certain species that are basically going to be, um, that they're going to, you're going to treat. The southern pine is, is, is very common. Um, hem fur out west is probably the most common out there. Um, in the Midwest, I have seen, at least from a plate material standpoint, sometimes you'll see red pine. Um, red pine, I believe, has a um, specific gravity of about 0.36. So that would not, and I'm not even saying that uh, anybody's using uh, treated red pine for ledger material, uh, but this SRR 1408 uh, would not, the details that we're showing here would not apply if you're using a uh, treated ledger that has specific gravity of, of less than 0.43. Um, if it's the treating, and again, uh, this information here is, I don't care if you're using, uh, att attaching to dimension a floor system with dimension lumber um, or, or what have you, uh, eye joist trusses, uh, these requirements are all the same. Ledger needs to be, um, you know, pressure treated um, by an approved process in accordance with uh, the American uh, Wood Protection Association standards. In the SRR 1408-01, we do include um, tables, 
or one table, and we've broken it out in, in this presentation, basically. What um, th th this table basically has, if you look at, if you can read this, you see the uh, very left-hand column says the trust connection condition and spacing. So in this case, the top part of this table is for connecting the ledger to the end of the floor trusses. And we're assuming that the floor trusses are spaced at 24 inches on center, which is very common. Um, the table can be divided top to bottom in two sections. The top two uh, rows underneath the headings um, have to do with if the live load is 40 pounds per square foot, dead load is 10 pounds per square foot, and the snow load is less than or equal to 40 pounds per square foot. Um, third column in provides two different connection details, one with uh, half-inch, six-inch legs, and the other with half-inch uh, diameter bolts. And then the remaining columns have to do with if your joist span for the deck is less than six feet, less than or equal to six feet, from the ledger to your first deck support beam, um, What then it gives you what the on center spacing of the fasteners need to be um, along that ledger. And then that have to also then align with either the end of the truss or with a key block. This is um, Again, a lot of information on this slide, but again, this is all in the SRR. Um, the, the one of the keys, uh, you know, earlier I mentioned about making sure that the um, end distance and edge distance requirements are met. Um, if you notice on this particular detail, and this is a, a detail for the vertical load connection, of where you're attaching the deck ledger to the ends of the uh, metal plate connected floor trusses. And again, it's requiring that in this case, the end of the, the, this uh, research report and these details um, require or assume that the uh, ribbon board will be no greater than a two by four. Uh, it's possible there may be some trust manufacturers out there that uh, have, will design for a deeper ribbon board that could, in essence, be used uh, that the ledger could be attached to. Um, this document doesn't uh, currently include any details regarding that. So basically what we're talking about again is attaching the deck ledger to the trusses or, and or key blocks. Um, the detail in this case also assumes that the uh, floor trusses have a double end vertical, so minimum three inches thick. Um, and minimum specific gravity of 0.42, okay, and again I mentioned that earlier, uh, a common species group with that specific gravity is spruce pine fir. Um, those of you that are manufacturers on this call that manufacture in the north, the spruce pine fir and spruce pine fir south are not the same. The specific gravity for spruce pine fir south is considerably less, so again what we're doing is this detail requires that the minimum specific gravity of the end verticals of the truss have to be uh, 0.42 or greater. Okay, this is a um, detail, again, in the document for the lateral load connection. Uh, not only do you have to make sure that the ledger is attached to support the gravity loads that it could be a, uh, that the deck will have to support, uh, but it also requires that you have to support um, or and, and transfer some potential lateral load from the deck into the floor assembly, and uh, that lateral load is a minimum 1,500 pounds, um, and it can either be transferred with some type of a tension tie. Um, hold down tension tie type of connection where the hold down is attached to the side of the, the deck board, or the, excuse me, the deck joist, and then there's also a uh, similar hold down that's attached uh, to the side of the uh, floor joist or framing member, 
and then those two hold downs are connected with a uh, some type of a tension tie. Uh, with metal plate connected wood trusses, it's uh, a bit more difficult to attach that hold down to the side of the truss. Um, the building code also allows that you can go with some type of a hold down device that is good for 750 pounds, but then you need to have a minimum of four of those on your deck, um, equally spaced with the outer two have to be within two feet of the end of the, uh, of the ledger board. So this particular detail is showing uh, an example of, of that, and that hold down then is attached with a leg into the end verticals of the truss, and then uh, in this case, the cross hatching that is on that on the side of the truss is a uh, sheet of seven or piece of seven sixteenths, twenty four sixteen span rated OSB or plywood that basically is attached to the side of the truss that this hold down is attached to, to again help to transfer that um, lateral load from the hold down um, up into the ultimately the diaphragm for the floor. Again, the um, requirements again in 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 the, in the uh, SR 1408-01 uh, would require a, a maximum uh, wood structural panel thickness that's used to sheath the wall would be uh, 15 30 seconds. Uh, code says uh, half inch thick. Um, I'm not aware of anybody making a, a nominal. Half uh, an excuse me, not nominal. An actual half-inch thick panel, uh, by far and away the most common wood structural sheathing that's used throughout most of the country. There are exceptions, but would be uh, oriented strand board and uh, 1530 seconds, uh, 3216 span rated uh, would be what we're really talking about. So that's why we're 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 giving you the net thickness, not the um, nominal. Um, ledger uh, attaching the ledger through the wood structural sheathing into one of the following, and we've already talked about this, but I'll just repeat it. Either the two ply two by four truss end verticals, as you see in this picture, or a four by four vertical web, if that happens, if that's what the ladder frame is framed with, or some type of a key, bo key block. Um, the attached uh, ledger. Uh, or the ledger is attached, excuse me, with uh, half inch by six inch leg screws or half inch diameter bolts with washers and nuts. The uh, SRR in basically is assumes that you have a maximum of one fastener per truss member or key block. And the fasteners are installed through the center line of the truss member or key block. Um, and that way, uh, by doing that, you're assuring that you're not going to be installing them so close to where, say, the metal connector plates may be attached to the, to the verticals that you could end up damaging the metal connector plate. Um, most of the plates we're talking about, the tooth length is uh, quarter inch, five sixteenths, that uh, it, the teeth are embedded into the, into the wood truss member. So by centering that uh, leg, screw, or bolt into the, uh, the end of the truss, the three, half, three uh, and a half inch dimension, uh, either for the truss member or end verticals, or the um, key blocks, uh, you're assuring that you're staying away from uh, the depth that the teeth could penetrate into the wood on the edges. Um, Fasteners, uh, if you're using lag screws, NDS requires that basically you have to you know, drill pilot holes or certainly lead holes, uh, and then same thing with, uh, with uh, bolts. And so the SRR has, tells the, gives the requirements in terms of, in, in, in inches, what the, uh, uh, either the, the, the lead hole or the clearance holes uh, need to be in terms of the size for the screws and the uh, bolts. Again, following just the red out of NDS. Um, all fasteners used with the treated wood have to be hot, to be hot dip, zinc coated, and they can include uh, galvanized steel, stainless steel, silicon bronze, copper. Again, these requirements, same thing are, that you'll find in the DCA6 uh, document. Um, again, the 
getting into the nitty-gritty in terms of what the fasteners, what ASTM standard they have to meet in terms of the, uh, the coating. Um, if you're using hardware for attaching the deck joists to the ledger, that also has to be hot dip galvanized. And again, if you know, uh, follow the requirements of uh, the hardware manufacturer in terms of you know for, for using in, in exposed applications. Um, the document also talks about if if you're uh, you know in an area that uh, the hardware can be exposed to salt water or located within 300 feet of the saltwater shoreline. Again, there are requirements in the building code um, and in FEMA standards that talk about the grade of uh, stainless steel that you have to use. Again, where you it's making sure that uh, the the fat you don't have to worry about uh, corrosion. Um, our document talks about, you know, we don't show flashing details, but we point out that, you know, you got to make sure that the uh, joint where at the top of the ledger and the wall is properly flashed so you don't get moisture intrusion in behind the treated um, ledger. Um, because obviously decay uh, in the, the wood structural sheathing behind the ledger um, as well as penetrating into the, uh, the, the framing, um, whether it's the end of the truss or uh, the key blocks or what have you, uh, that's going to weaken your connection. And uh, that previous picture, obviously there was no OSB in that, but um, Oriented strand board or, or uh, those types of um, strand products, uh, if they're not treated, and typically you're not going to find OSB that is treated, um, they do tend to, uh, if the conditions are right, they do tend to, to decay at a, at a much faster rate than solid wood or even plywood will. So you've got to be real careful of their flashing connections. Um, okay, you've already seen this. Uh, we've talked about this table. So again, if you're attaching to your deck to floor trusses, um, in this case, you're allowed to go up to this. This table goes to a 16-foot span for your uh, deck joists, um, and again, that would be the span from the ledger connection to your support uh, farther out on the deck. Again, we've talked about this and I apologize but we're going to keep hammering it on, on it uh, you know we're, we're talking about attaching the deck ledger to the ends of the trusses you have to have a minimum uh, two ply vertical um, if it's a so, sometimes a truss could be manufactured with a 4x4 vertical certainly the ladders could be manufactured with a 4x4 vertical web um, or for key blocks and the uh, assumption is that the minimum specific gravity of these verticals is point greater than or equal to 0.42. So that would include Douglas fir, hem fir, southern pine, and SPF, but not SPF south. Um, what I just want to point out here is now, again, that minimum edge and end distance requirements. Notice the uh, dimension, the minimum dimension that's called out that that top con uh, connector has to be from the top of the ledger is a two inch minimum, okay? And the bottom has to be at least three quarters of an inch up from the bottom of the ledger, okay? Um, now, if I'm using a two by four ribbon board, that's three and a half inches deep, Obviously, if and I only come down and I attach that ledger and I put that screw in or that bolt in two inches below the top of the ledger board, um, I'm not going to meet the end distance requirements for that end vertical that basically the ribbon board sits on. So that's where, you know, and again, depending upon how this, what type of a drop you have in the deck, uh, you might be able to get by with a two inch uh, dimension from the top of the ledger down to that uh, where you've put your first fastener in. Um,
but chances are you will meet the two inch minimum for the distance from the top of the ledger down to the uh, lag screw or bolt um, because you're going to have to be more than much more than two inches down um, in terms of from the top of the truss so that you meet the minimum uh, two inch uh, space from uh, right below that ribbon board down to where that fastener comes into the truss. And again, from coming from the bottom up, um, you need to be a minimum three and a half inches from the top of the bottom cord of the truss up to where that uh, the lowest fastener on the from the ledger board is is located as it goes into the truss. Um, the SRR 1408 includes some detailing for the key blocking, and again, this would be installed. These are blocks that are going to be installed between the trusses that are built so that they fit in tightly against the ribbon board, and they frame tight against the underside of the floor sheathing and tight to the top of the plate of the wall below, and then they can be used to attach the deck ledger to the uh, to the key block as well as to the end of the floor truss. Allow you to get uh, closer on center spacing for your ledger connection. Um, as far as the lateral load detailing is concerned, if we're uh, attaching this hole down to the end of the, of the floor truss, as we, I talked about before, we want to make sure that you're attaching that hole down through the end of the truss and then in turn we're reinforcing that end with the OSB sheathing and the OSB is cut to you know notched out to to fit tight around the continuous ribbon board that's typically going to be on on the end of the truss and then is uh, nailed to the side of the of uh, the truss that the hold downs are attached to if the hold downs are attached to a where they happen to fall they're attached to a key block well then uh, that's going to require a, a little bit different detail. So we're in this case assuming that the hold down uh, for the lateral load are attached to the end of the truss. And again, uh, these slides just kind of step through uh, what to use. Minimum 7 16 thick, uh, 24 16 uh, span rated OSB for the gusset, OSB or plywood I should say. And again, making sure that you carefully notch around the, uh, the ribbon board for a nice tight fit and then you're going to attach the OSB gusset to each 4x2 truss member with one row of 10D.131 by 3 inch uh, pneumatic nails at 3 inches on center. And again, what we talked about before, making sure that the fastener is uh, placed, you know, through the center of the member, so that you're not going to interfere with any of the the penetration of the connector plate teeth into the side of the member. Okay, the so that was attaching the ledger to the end of the truss trusses. For those applications where you've got a ladder frame and you want to attach the the deck to the side of the trusses. Um, the bottom part of this, you, you saw the slide, it's not two tables in the SRR, it's one table. This is the bottom part of that. Now, the ladder frames are typically framed with the vertical studs at 16 inches on center, and that's what we're assuming here. Um, they may only be framed with um, 4 by 2 vertical studs. Um, and again, we're basing everything on using basically a three and a half inch wide so that we get plenty of end distance and edge distance requirements for the leg screws and the bolts. Um, so if you're a builder and, um, or a truss manufacturer and you know that you're going to have, uh, you know, you're on, your, on the house, uh, that they're going to have, uh, they've got a, you know, uh, sliding doors on the main floor, let's say, that uh, go off the side of the house and you're going to have a, uh, you're providing a ladder frame underneath there, would strongly encourage you to think about um, manufacturing that truss with um, four by vertical studs so that they've got, uh, provide a good uh, solid uh, surface to connect the ledger to. Again, same thing now, we've got details that talk about the vertical load connection attaching the ledger to either the vertical studs in the um, 
uh, ladder frame, or if you have to go to a closer on-center spacing than 16, um, one would have to add key blocks. And then there's also details for attaching for the lateral load connection, and then how to reinforce, again, trying to take that lateral load from the end vertical, or excuse me, from the vertical stud in the ladder or the key block, and getting that up into uh, the uh, floor diaphragm. Uh, there's also some, again, some details that are provided for the key block and then locking the key block into, um, into place. Again, everything based on minimum of uh, 0.42 specific gravity. And then, again, requirements for uh, reinforcing whatever uh, vertical stud or key block is used to attach the uh, lateral load hold down uh, for reinforcing that to make sure that that load can be transferred up into the diaphragm, that we're not relying on uh, the connector plates at the top and uh, that are attaching that uh, vertical stud to the top and bottom cord. Uh, because many times you're talking about a one by three plates, um, which again the truss is not being designed for that lateral load. So we want to basically just take that load out of the truss and get it up into the floor diaphragm. And again, just walking through and, and making sure that uh, you know proper notching to get a nice tight fit. And then spelling out. In this case, what we're doing is we're attaching this block by adding additional nails through the floor sheathing into the top edge of the block to transfer that load up into the diaphragm. Before we go to, if there's any questions, assuming, well, there's still 27 people that are showing they're, they're on. I don't know how many of you are asleep, but I guess we'll find out. Before we go to questions, though, let me just uh, go to the next slide. Um, the, the document we've been going through is a 1408-01, okay? Um, you can download it by going to the website, and here's the website address, sbcindustry.com. Now, let me see if I can do this without mucking things up. Okay, yeah, good. Um, so, if you go to sbcindustry.com, this is the home page, and you go over here to the right, and you'll note under technical, go down to, there's, there's several different ways that you can get to where I'm going to show you. Um, best practices, um, we're going to get to that page here in a minute, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to show you one way to get to it. You can also get to it by just clicking on the best practices, and then you can kind of go backwards in the system. The SRR that we talked about, go down to under technical, publications, go over here, and click on research reports. Okay, and uh, what you're looking for in this case, the research reports are listed in uh, numeric order going from the most recent down to the oldest. And um, the document that's currently on there was updated the end of May 2016, but the uh, research report number is 1408-01. So if you click on that, okay, you're going to go to this page right here. And, uh, okay, you want to download a, copy, a PDF of the report, you click on the red button, okay? Go to the educational program, and what you can do is um, you can open up a, either a PDF or a PowerPoint of not the particular presentation that we just went through, but having to do with, um, you know, how to install, step-by-step um, -step how to install and some of the detail information that's in the report that are included in PowerPoint. So if, if you are giving a presentation and you want to use this presentation, that'd be a, a way to, to do that. Um, if you click on Installation Guide, you'll be taken to this page. And this is the Best Practices page. So if, if um, back on the home page you went over the uh, technical and the first drop-down was best practices. If you cl clicked on that for um, 
you're going to come to a page where it's going to list all the different reports that we have. You would click on the, uh, the ledger attachment page and it's going to take you right here. And what this does is this provides a step-by-step -step, um, on how to, what to do. And we've divided it into either where the ledger is attached to the end of the truss or in this case if it's attached to the side through a ladder frame then you would click here. Um, so for instance here's the intro talks about what the minimum ledger requirements are that we talked about and then I go to step one I determine what the size deck is that I want to put on uh, what my loads are that I'm designing the deck for and then it'll you know tells you what the spacing is of what the you know the fasteners have to be for spacing and uh, you know so on and so forth. Step two talks about you know make sure that uh, if wood structural sheathing is, does not exceed 15 30 seconds which uh, probably won't and so on and so forth. Okay now installation instructions and safety information if you click on that that'll take you kind of back to this presentation that uh, but that specifically talks about installation instructions And then finally, if you're either the builder or a building official, um, we have this handy-dandy inspection checklist that you can print out. And this basically you know, provides what we've just gone through uh, in a checklist format where uh, you can check that, yes, we've done this, we've done this, we've done this, and so on and so forth. OK. Um, all right, so having showed you that, any questions? Um, okay, somebody oh. apparently. Yeah, Trish, it looks like say, we're having trouble with, that. Um, with the audio. Um, okay, yeah. All right, so we got a bunch of questions. I apologize, everybody. I didn't see this uh, the chat. Um, Maybe you can review some of those questions that were asked down in. Yes. Okay. So first one from Buddy is uh, they'll he made a note that we'll make the change. Thanks, Buddy. Um, yeah, good point. Um, we don't want to show carriage bolts. I apologize that uh, one of the slides I, I believe did show a carriage bolt, and, and that's got to get updated. Um, Yeah, then Buddy asked, uh, and this would be where we're talking about the attaching the deck ledger to the side of the ladder frame. Um, we showed dimension lumber blocking that is attached to the side of the um, vertical web member that that uh, lateral hold down is attached to. Um, and then, so that's nailed to the side, and we call it what the minimum nailing has to be. And then that block is installed tight to the underside of the floor sheathing, and then additional nails are added through the floor sheathing. And again, this is kind of you know during construction. Obviously, if it's a finished floor, <laughs> you're not going to be adding that. Well, you know, and we've got some other detailing um, that will that actually would have to be take place so that you're uh, can ultimately take the load from that block and get it up into the sheathing. So yeah, good point. Um, Justification for the non-concurrent um, live load and snow load. Um, yeah, basically, the assumption there is that you're not going to be having a party out on your deck when you've got full snow load on it. Uh, in fact, you're probably not going to have uh, snow load on that deck when um, and then have have a, a big gathering on it. Um, so it's kind of like a one or the other type of thing. But the question was, you know, typically, okay, um, 
the different load combinations that are included in the building code or in ASC 7 would include, um, you know, you, you can't have a roof live load acting concurrently with a, say, snow load. Uh, but potentially, you could have a floor live load um, acting concurrently with a roof live load or snow load, but then you're allowed to take a 25% uh, reduction or use three core, uh, uh, you know, 75% of the uh, floor live load in in, con in concurrent with 75% of the snow load. Um, Travis. Uh, asked a question about what to do if, if you have a finished ceiling application. Yeah, again, um, you know, this is a case where if the we probably need to, well, if you're adding the deck after things are finished off and you've got a finished ceiling, then obviously the details that we're showing here are not going to be uh, applicable. Um, it's just not going to work. You're going to have to remove the, if you want to attach and, and tie things back in um, by adding the blocking and what have you, uh, yeah, you'd have to basically remove a section of the ceiling, uh, do the work up above in the cavity, and then uh, work on reinstalling the, uh, the finished ceiling. Uh, let's see, next question. And I think that pretty much wraps up the questions from what I can see. Are there any other questions? Um, if after this presentation, if anybody wants to, to give me a call, I can certainly uh, certainly we can talk discuss uh, further. Uh, my direct line is 608-310-6703. If there are no further questions, I guess we'll call this meeting adjourned. Thank you very much, everybody. And